Jaffa, Holy Land, May 1123. The Venetian fleet was resupplying in Cyprus when Doge Domenico Michiel suddenly learned that the main Fatimid fleet, encumbered by slow-moving transport ships, had sailed from Ashkelon aiming to reinforce the Tyre garrison. Leaping upon their exposed enemies, the Venetians launched a daring assault on the Fatimid galleys. On that foggy day, the Fatimid convoy noticed a small Venetian squadron on the horizon. Counting on an easy victory, the Fatimid fleet peeled off their course to face the approaching Latin ships. But as they began their approach, they soon saw the rest of the Frankish ships gradually moving out of the fog, their number equaling the Muslim ships. But how did the Venetian fleet find itself in the middle of a crusade to begin with? In today's video, we will dive deep into the lesser known crusade, known as the Venetian Crusade, and the impact it had on the ever-changing political spectrum of the medieval Levant. If you are interested in the history of the Crusades, check out our series on the Albigensian Crusades, available exclusively for our YouTube members and patrons. Join their ranks via the link in the description and pinned comment to watch the completed series on the Albigensian Crusade, as well as the Fall of Sparta, First Punic War, Italian Reunification Wars, History of Prussia, Biography of Sulla, and the ongoing series on the Russo-Japanese War, Reconquista, Pacific War, World War II North African Campaign, Persian Wars, War of Spanish Succession, and much more. In the aftermath of the Battle of Hab and the dramatic campaign of 1119, tensions in northern Syria remained at an all-time high. The Artikid Atabeg il Ghazi was not done fighting the Franks and demanded a rematch. By the next year, he had renewed his feud with Antioch and Edessa. The Artikid split his forces in half, delegating his governor of Athareb, Bulak, to raid Antiochian territory, while the main force would besiege the city of Edessa. However, the Latins had already been made aware of Ilghazi's intentions. Consequently, Antioch's governor, Patriarch Bernard of Valence, and Count of Edessa, Jocelyn of Courtenay, declined to meet Ilghazi in open battle, opting instead to disrupt his main supply line. Since the areas of northern Syria had already been devastated, Muslim armies had no potential loot and plunder, diminishing the enthusiasm of Ilghazi's men. Moreover, the news of Baldwin II returning with Jerusalem's army only further damaged Artikir's morale. Having nothing to fight for resulted in Turkoman warriors deserting Ilghazi's force en masse. Reluctant, Ilghazi signed a truce with King Baldwin that was meant to last for one year. Thus, after two years of struggle, both sides were relieved from fighting one another and could finally divert their attention in different directions. After securing the northern frontier, Baldwin II could put his efforts into solidifying his realm. Ever since the times of the First Crusade and the conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, there had been no single official law or set of rules in his kingdom except the one borrowed from feudal Europe. The Latins quickly found out that in order for the Crusader states to survive, they needed better organized social structures that could withstand their surrounding neighbors. On the 16th of January 1120, Baldwin II, together with Jerusalem's Patriarch Gourmand, gathered most of the secular and clerical figures in the kingdom to the town of Nablus in order to discuss and resolve all internal affairs. This event, also known as the Council of Nablus, was the first crusader convocation assembled in the Holy Land that sanctioned a set of 25 laws, rights for the clergy, and even social norms acknowledged by the Latins in the Outremer. It resolved the matters of investiture between the church and the state by clearly setting boundaries between them. Clerical figures like priests, bishops, and patriarchs were banned from military affairs and were only allowed to defend the Christian communities and spiritually support crusading armies. During the discussion, laws were passed to prevent Christians from integrating into the surrounding Muslim environment and adopting Muslim lifestyles by prohibiting marriage between different faiths. In addition, the new laws also presented a set of punishments for crimes like oath-breaking, adultery, bigamy, and other sins sometimes common among crusaders. But the most important matter discussed at the Council of Nablus was the official acknowledgement of the military orders by the Kingdom of Jerusalem. The first of them were the Knights of Hospitalis. The Knights Hospitala started as a group of Italian merchants of Amalfi, who were led by a man named Gerard from the same city. Together they travelled to the Holy Land back in the 11th century, and with the permission of the Fatimids, who ruled the region at the time, they established a hospital under the name of St. John the Almsgiver. 
Their main objective was to provide aid and protection for pilgrims eager to visit the holy sites. Their activity was halted by the Seljuk takeover of Jerusalem. During the First Crusade, and later creation of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Hospitallers proved themselves very useful in aiding the Latins, providing care for the initially all Italian pilgrims and aiding the kings of Jerusalem in battles against the Seljuks and Fatimids. Their actions were rewarded by Pope Pascal II, who officially acknowledged the Hospitallers Regula in 1113. However, as the fighting between the Christians and the Muslims intensified, pilgrim routes were gradually more endangered by the Fatimid raiding parties or local Muslim bandits. When Master Gerard passed away around 1118 or 1120, his successor, Master Raymond de Puy, reformed and restructured the order and extended its actions beyond hospital work. Marked by a white cross on a black tunic, the Hospitallers started to fight the local banditry and even served in open military campaigns under the King of Jerusalem. At Nablus, their actions were officially acknowledged by the entire kingdom, allowing them to expand their operations to the entire Outremer. The rebranding of the Knights Hospitaller was heavily influenced by the beginning of another equally famous order, the Templars. The Knights Templar were founded by a French knight of Champagne, Eau de Péance, who in 1118 managed to convince King Baldwin II to set up a new military quarter in one of the wings of the royal palace located at the former al Asqa Mosque. Filled by his knightly companions, they formed a special order, vowing to actively defend the Christian pilgrims along the way to Jerusalem. The Templars bore a red cross on their tunics, with knights and clerics wearing a white tunic, whereas the sergeants wore a black one. All brothers followed St. Benedictine's rule of monastic Christian asceticism, with the Council of Nablus settled, the King of Jerusalem granted the Knights Templar his full support, allowing them to have their own outposts, land, and independent organization from the crown, in exchange for providing a disciplined military force and sharing the burden of garrisoning several border castles. As the various knightly orders of the Levant grew in numbers, their support would play a key role in the future of the Latin states in the Levant. The only man opposing the Nablus Council was Pont of Tripoli. The Count was furious at Baldwin for claiming Antioch for himself, and grew ever more fearful that Jerusalem might come to dominate over all the Outremer states. In an act of protest, he forbade any Tripolitan noble or religious figures from his domains to attend the Council, which only strained his relations with the King of Jerusalem. Later on, in 1122, Pont even went as far as to rebel against Labor. However, as Baldwin rallied his army with the Holy Cross and approached Tripoli itself, Paul gave up and reconciled with the king. Meanwhile, on the Muslim side, Ilghazi embarked on a military campaign into Georgia in 1121. The Articid Atabeg accepted an invitation from the Emirate of Tiflis, located in modern-day Tbilisi. In recent years, the Emirate had become increasingly threatened by the burgeoning power of the Bagrationi dynasty. Ilghazi was soundly defeated by the Georgians at the Battle of Didgori, and was forced to retreat back to Mardin, with his manpower resources severely depleted. Further bad news for Ilghazi soon followed, as his own son, Suleiman, who governed his territories of Aleppo, revolted against his father. In order to stabilize his borders with the Franks, while he dealt with this internal crisis, he ceded the fortresses of Athareb and Sardana back to the Latins, to which Baldwin II gladly obliged. Ilghazi's previous fruits of conquest were now again in the hands of the Crusader states. The civil war and the loss of bordering castles proved to be a heavy blow for the Atikids. Tired of trying to keep a lid on internal divisions, Ilghazi gradually delegated parts of his domains into the hands of his relatives, only further decentralizing his state. Attempting to retake Zardana, he assembled his army and marched west to confront Baldwin once more. However, as the two sides were approaching an upcoming engagement, Ilghazi died of apoplexy, forcing the Muslim army to withdraw. Once a powerful warlord willing to challenge all his neighbors, Ilghazi died as a broken man, his empire fading from his eyes. Labor was relieved by how things turned out, but he had little time for celebrations as he had to turn his focus on Transjordan in order to repel a Togtekan invasion, after which he could finally return to Jerusalem. Ever since the Battle of Ager Sanguini in 1119, King Baldwin II Labor had sought military aid from all corners of Catholic Europe. 
Much to his disappointment, most European leaders like Pope Calixtus II and Holy Roman Emperor Henry V were embroiled in the investiture controversy, resulting in no aid for the Crusader states. The only candidate interested in aiding the crusading cause proved to be the Maritime Republic of Venice. Familiar with trade in the Levant, the Republic desired more trading posts in the region from which it could profit. When Baldwin's emissaries approached the Venetian doge, Domenico Michiel, with promises to provide the most serene Republic with just that, the latter proved willing to cooperate. Meanwhile, the Venetians had also received a letter from Calixtus II encouraging the Republic to go on crusade. The Pope's relations with the German Emperor were, by that point, gradually improving, and the Bishop of Rome needed to focus Europe's attention somewhere else. Just like in 1095, the Holy Land seemed to be the perfect solution. With papal blessing, a crusade was announced in 1122, with the aim of supporting Jerusalem in its darkest hour. Word was quickly spread across Europe, and soon knights and pilgrims from France, Germany, Bohemia and Italy gathered near Venice. With the final preparations completed on the 8th of August 1122, the Crusaders and Venetians set sail from the Venetian lagoon. The number of ships in the historical sources varies from 72 to 120, but it is safe to say that the Crusaders numbered around 100 vessels with a maximum of 15,000 men on board. Their voyage proved to be more problematic than previously expected, as while the Venetians were sailing around the Adriatic coast, they were tempted to renew their quarrel with the Byzantine Emperor John Comnenus over their unfavourable trade rights with the Greeks. Wanting to settle their score with the Eastern Romans, the Venetian fleet attacked a strategic fortress on the island of Corfu. But much to the Doge's dismay, the siege dragged on for over a year, and the other European crusaders became restless about sailing to Jerusalem. Finally, the pilgrims' voices were heard, as a messenger from Jerusalem urged the Venetians to abandon the siege of Corfu in favour of reaching the Holy Land, as the recent events unfolding in the Outremer required the crusaders' immediate attention. Ilghazi's death in 1122 had emboldened Chosselin to raid Aleppo territory and attempt to secure a strategic crossing of the Euphrates at Balis. Like during his previous fights with the Bedouins at Transjordan, he planned for a swift action with only a hundred men. Confident in Ilghazi's realm decentralization, the Count rushed his force inside enemy territory, neglecting the remaining Artikid Turkoman force. Much to Jocelyn's surprise, his force was ambushed and defeated by the Turkomans headed by Ilghazi's son, Nurajdola Belikghazi, who killed most of the Latin knights, all except Jocelyn and Galeran of Le Puisse, Lord of Birgek. Elated by his easy victory, Belik decided to keep his hostage and imprison him at the remote Carpert fortress in southern Armenia. Hearing the news of Jocelyn's troubles, Baldwin II decided to take charge of the county's overlordship and initiate a rescue mission, gathering a few hundred knights, sergeants and Turkopoles for the action. By quickly reaching Edessa, Le Bourg re-established order in the county. Afterwards, the king rushed to the place of Jocelyn's captivity. However, Baldwin's raid proved to be as short-sighted as Jocelyn's. As he tried to cross the Euphrates River at Gaga, he was ambushed and captured by Belik, and thrown into the same prison as Jocelyn. The situation turned out to be dire for the King of Jerusalem. The loss of Jocelyn could only be felt as a loss of the Count's personal prestige, but a king's captivity would put the entire Kingdom of Jerusalem, including all Latin states, to the test. Meanwhile, by the end of May 1123, the Venetians and the rest of the Crusaders had finally sailed to Acre. After the initial lavish celebration in Jerusalem, the Latin nobility entered into a heavy debate on where to direct the Venetian fleet. Only Tyre and Ashkelon remained in Muslim hands from the remaining strongholds and harbours in the Outremer. The Latin barons from Judea favoured an offensive on Ashkelon, while the barons of Galilee opted for the latter. Ultimately, the deciding voice came from the Venetians, who preferred to sail upon Tyre, mainly because of the better harbour conditions. During the discussions, Domenico Michiel demanded terms for their service. Realising that the opportunity could not wait until Baldwin's return from captivity, Constable William and the newly appointed Patriarch Wamund reluctantly agreed. They signed a treaty, also known as Pactum Wamundi, which stated that in exchange for Venice's naval and military assistance in the Holy Land, 
the Kingdom of Jerusalem would allow Venetian merchants to settle one street in each major harbour and city in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, except the Holy City itself, and enjoy certain privileges, like an exemption from taxation. The Republican traders could use their own coin weight measures and standards during the transactions, and were guaranteed rights to have a separate church, market, bath, mill and oven in every city. Furthermore, upon the capture of Tyre, Ashkelon and the rest of the harbours, one-third of the city and one-third of the city's surroundings were to be handed to the Venetians. This agreement was very favourable to the Venetians, for it gave them the lion's share in the lucrative trade routes of the Levant. As the talks ended, the Crusaders and the Venetians approached Tyre and began the siege on the 15th of February 1124. Luck was on the Crusaders' side, for the city was in turmoil due to strained relations between Fatimid Egypt and the Emirate of Damascus. Previously, Tyre was governed by Togtekin's governor, Masud, and the city still maintained prayers for the Fatimid Caliph, which, according to Muslim custom, meant that formally the city still belonged to the Fatimids. The Egyptian vizier Al-Afdal was hesitant to change this delicate political balance, wanting to maintain good relations with both the Fatimids and the Atabeg of Damascus. However, the situation changed rapidly after his assassination in 1121 by his own caliph Al-Amir. After this, the Fatimid caliph sent a fleet to Tyre, which managed to lure out Masud and bring him back to Egypt. After this successful kidnapping, Masud was forced to hand the city over to the Fatimids, after which he was allowed to return to Togtekin. When the Damascene warlord realized he had been outsmarted and nothing could be done, he decided to allow the Fatimids to keep the city, probably out of fear of breaking the alliance. He remained with his forces behind Jordan, awaiting any opportunity to retake the city. This infighting amongst the Muslims was very beneficial for the Franks. Without Alamir and Togtekin coordinating their efforts, the Franks could easily defend their positions against any Fatimid or Damascene reinforcements. However, despite all these factors, their opponents still couldn't be underestimated. The defenders of Tyre could still rely on resupply and reinforcements from the sea, as long as the Fatimids possessed a strong navy in the region. Moreover, the Crusaders were pressured even further due to Alamir's army arriving from the south. The Caliph ordered the building of as many ships as possible, amounting to his fleet of over 70 galleys. He intended to relieve the city by striking the Crusader forces from land and sea. By the end of May 1123, the Egyptian army had moved from Ashkelon through Jaffa. Without any hesitation, Constable William hastily mobilized knights, pilgrims and citizens of Jerusalem, numbering around 7,000 men, to confront the Fatimid threat. Marching with a relic of the Holy Cross, the forces of Jerusalem blocked the Muslim march on Jaffa near Ibelin. When both sides spotted each other near the village of Kako, the Latins blocked the path, providing time for the Venetian sailors to embark on their ships and get out of danger. As the Caliph's forces approached the Christian host, the battle ensued. Despite the numerical superiority of the Fatimids, William's army had higher morale in the presence of the Holy Relic. Encouraged, the Latins pushed forward, and with great ferocity, finally broke through the Fatimid center. Seeing their formation broken, the Muslims fled, leaving their camp and spoils in the hands of the victors. After this, the Crusaders returned to Tyre, celebrating their victory. When the Egyptian fleet learned about the defeat of their land counterpart, the Fatimid admiral decided to return to Ashkelon, denying the Venetians the chance to engage with the Egyptians for a while. When both of his forces returned to Ashkelon, the Caliph decided to change the direction of his army for Jerusalem in order to divert the Crusaders' attention, also dividing Venetian galleys from their Latin suppliers while his fleet would continue to supply the city. Meanwhile, as the Venetian fleet was resupplying in Cyprus, the Venetian doge learned that the Fatimid main fleet had sailed again from Ashkelon, aiming to reinforce the Tyre garrison again. The Egyptian ships were slowed down by the increased number of transport ships, causing the fleet to sail slower than was possible. Knowing that such an occasion may not repeat itself for a long time, the Venetian doge launched a daring assault on the Fatimid galleys. He divided his vessels into two groups, with the stronger ships at the front to lure enemy ships into battle. On a foggy morning, the Fatimid convoy noticed a small Venetian squadron. Counting on an easy victory, the Fatimid fleet broke away from their course and turned to face the approaching Latin ships. But as they advanced upon their enemy, the rest of the Frankish ships gradually moved out of the fog, 
with their number outgrowing the Muslim ships. Soon, panic and chaos spread across the Fatimid fleet. The Venetian ships caught the Egyptian galleys and engaged in fierce deck-to-deck -deck fighting. In the midst of combat, the Venetian sailors captured four galleys and six transport ships. The Most Serene Republic's navy carved their way up to the Fatimid flagship, boarded it and killed the enemy admiral. When the Egyptian sailors heard of the death of their commander, they panicked and fled, sailing back to Ashkelon. The Venetians pursued their foes as far as Alarish, then returned north to rejoin the rest of the Latin army. William of Tyre, probably exaggerating the outcomes of the battle, stated that over 4,000 corpses of Fatimid sailors were carried out onto the shore, turning the sea red. The naval victory at Jaffa was a turning point in the siege. Now the city was encircled by both land and sea. Moreover, water and rations were starting to dwindle, and the situation inside the city was getting direr with each passing day. Its citizens again decided to send letters to al -Amir and Toktekin, desperately pleading for immediate assistance, stating that the city would be forced to surrender if no further provisions were provided. Sadly for Tyre, the Fatimids had just suffered two defeats in a row, and the Caliph felt that he was in no position to send any more reinforcements. However, not all was lost for the city of Tyre. Togtekin was on his way, having marched his army to the aid of the city, probably counting on an easy victory, assuming that both the Latins and Fatimids had sustained heavy losses from the siege. Having mustered a huge army near Damascus, Togtekin easily crossed Galilee and encamped just four miles outside the city walls. The Crusaders, shocked at the speed of the Damascene army, thought the attack was coordinated between the Emir of Damascus and the Fatimid Caliph, so they split their forces into three groups. William of Burr, together with Pont of Tripoli, would use all the Latin cavalry in an attempt to stop Togtekin's advance. The Venetians would sail around Tyre, expecting the next assault from the Fatimid fleet, while the third group would guard the siege engines, preventing the defenders from sallying out of Tyre. Togtekin, on the other hand, counted on his element of surprise. When he heard that the crusading force was rushing to meet him in battle, he decided to return home. At the same time, the Venetian fleet, suspecting an attack from an Egyptian fleet, seized the small harbour of Scandalium, only to find that the Egyptian fleet was nowhere to be found. The only remaining move to be made was by Tyre's defenders, and in a desperate sally, they managed to burn down some of the siege equipment. Undeterred, the Crusaders decided to double their efforts, since it was certain that no help would arrive anytime soon. They sent a letter to Antioch for more engineers, including one Armenian named Havadik, whose skills and expertise allowed the Crusaders to cover their losses and even further intensify catapult and ballistae firepower on the city walls. Hearing of the siege's progress, Tuktekin was again called for aid. This time, Tuktekin knew all too well that capitulation was inevitable and the crusading force was too numerous. Finally, the Emir of Damascus opened negotiations with the Crusaders in the name of Tyre. During the talks, terms of surrender were presented. The city would be handed to the Latins, and in exchange, the Muslim population could leave freely for Damascus with their property intact. This proposal was ill-received by some of the Crusaders, but in a heated discussion, William of Burr managed to convince the rest to agree with the final statement. After the terms were presented to Togtekin, the Emir of Damascus agreed, and on the 7th of July 1124, the city was finally handed over to the Franks. The Latins also fulfilled their obligations to the Venetians by giving them control of one-third of Tyre. As the most serene Republic fleet sailed back to the Venetian lagoon, they also reached a favourable trade agreement with the Byzantines, thus establishing themselves as the main powerhouse of maritime trade in the eastern Mediterranean. The Venetian Crusade marked the beginning of the Crusader Kingdom's growing dependence on the Italian Maritime Republic. Thanks to the signed Pactum Wamundi, Venice was allowed to become a main benefactor of the trade in the Levant, which could quickly unfold into political influence, as well as indicating a foreshadowing of the events of the disastrous Fourth Crusade. Still, the Latins managed to achieve a great victory, and with only Ashkelon remaining, almost the entire coastline of the Holy Land belonged to the Franks which resulted in a drastic shift in the balance of naval power in favour of the Crusader states. This allowed for an increased influx of pilgrims from Europe. 
Furthermore, the Kingdom of Jerusalem was put to the test, and thanks to King Baldwin's organization, it managed not only to survive without his presence, but also to expand its territory. In our next video, we will talk about Baldwin's fate, which resulted in the fierce Battle of Azaz. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to ensure you don't miss it. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.